What's up everybody, this is Barry Fishchain and today I'm bringing you a care video on long tentacle anemone or also known as corkscrew anemone. You can see my corkscrew anemone down here, you can see the long tentacles which the name suggests. Um, you can also see they kind of curl up a little bit which is also the reason why they're called corkscrew. Sometimes they actually sort of form in like a spiral um, which looks really funny. Um, Corkscrew anemone is one of the more easier anemones because they do tolerate quite a lot of different water parameters. They still do not like, um, you know, high nitrates and high phosphates because, um, you know, they are um, an invertebrate and most invertebrates just don't like that. Um, also, an important thing to notice is that. Um, this anemone is photosynthetic, however, even though it does get a lot of it, its nutrients out of the light, um, you have to keep in mind that this anemone really likes to grow. And this uh, anemone actually grows um, almost two foot, which is really, really big. Um, so, because of this growth, um, and it wants to grow this much, it is actually best to feed it um, I would say once every two or three weeks with um, some shrimp, some crustaceans, some small fish, something like that. Um, you know, I, I've heard of people feeding them silver sides, I've heard of people feeding them um, mices and krill and um, you know, things like that. I personally usually feed them mices and small table shrimp um, because table shrimp contains a lot of, um, a lot of nutrients that are really good. Um, for anemones, um, or pretty much for all living uh, organisms, pretty much. Um, you can also see here the reason why some people call it um, red base anemone is because, as you can see, most long tentacle anemone actually has a red foot. But this one I have right here is not one of the more common ones, this is actually one of the little bit more rare ones. Um, that actually has green tentacles and a red foot, which is a pretty rare combination. Um, I would say though that uh, the most common long tentacle anemone is just probably the normal um, sort of brownish um, tan sort of color uh, anemone. Um, it's also called long tentacle sand anemone and the reason for this is I think this is a huge mistake a lot of anemone keepers do. Um, is that they think that they attach to rocks, they think all anemones attach to rocks but it's actually very few anemones that attach to rocks, it's actually a very little percentage of all anemone species that do that most anemones actually like to be in sand for this reason it's best to, for example if you, if you get a long tentacle anemone I would actually recommend um, a, probably a 4 inch sand bed, um, so a pretty deep sand bed because these guys actually like to hide in there sometimes they sort of curl into the sand and um, you can see mine has attached here where my sand is at its peak I guess you can say um, because my damselfish keeps um, keeps digging sand over here from from the front um, to over here um, and you can see here there are also small worms and things like that that are crawling around here small copepods things like that um, you know um, and this anemone actually found out so it crawled over here and it just began to sort of um, it sometimes it attaches itself to the glass sometimes on the wall uh, the acrylic wall in the back and sometimes it just puts its foot down the sand it's kind of different what it wants to do um, it's doing really well over here at least because it gets a lot of lighting and um, this is another thing I would recommend at least get moderate light lighting because it's actually really important um, this call is very dependent on its photosynthetic um, and its photosynthetic uh, nutrients that it will get. Um, it, it it really needs it, so you gotta make sure that um, you get enough lighting for it. Um, I really like this anemone because I actually think that it's one of those um, really beautiful sand anemones. Some of the sand anemones out there are just pure brown, and the tentacles are sort of. Um, you know, a normal sand anemone doesn't look very attractive, it's just, it looks like a big Aptasia almost, and if you have seen a big Aptasia, it's like the disc, um, if you don't know what the disc is on 
uh, what the disc is on a uh, anemone is. It's basically if you have the foot right here, and um, there's this sort of, of of flat disc where the tentacles kind of come out come out of, um, and then the mouth sits in the middle. Um, sometimes a little bit away from the middle is actually kind of weird. Anyway, um, this disc um, with, with, with the long tentacle anemone is uh, completely filled uh, densely with tentacles, whereas the sand anemone it sort of goes out like here and there. It's not really that pretty. Um, there's a long space between all the tentacles, which is not very attractive in my opinion. Um, for the water flow on these guys, I would say medium to low because it's high water flow around this anemone is not the best thing you can do. They do like water flow, but does just don't overdo it. Um, a little bit of water flow will be fine, you know, it does need water flow, um, but just a little bit, not too much. Um, also, what I would recommend is um, if you have if you have um, thought of getting any cluggy clownfish um, or any other um, um, clownfish that looks similar to clown uh, cluggies, you know those are a really good choice for long tentacle anemones because um, long tentacle anemones pretty much except like cluggy clownfish is probably the best choice for long tentacle anemones. It's actually the preferred anemone. So and and you know, cluggy clownfish is not are not very piggy. So whenever they see an anemone, they'll just dive right into it. Whereas some of you guys who keep uh, ocellaris and pecula clownfish with anemones and tried making them host each other and things like that, you know, it can be really hard because ocellaris and pecula clownfish are a little bit more um, they're a little bit more piggy than um, than these guys are. You know, my cluggies always dive down in my anemone whenever they feel threatened. You know, they always jump down there sometimes, um, and whenever there is a food, a, a type of food that they can't swallow, they actually just give it to the anemone, which is rather unique, and it actually gives you some few benefits, you know, um, they will feed the anemone, etc, etc. Also, um, it's, it's good because if you know how the symbiosis between long tentacle, oh, well, not long tentacle anemone, um, anemones and clownfish works, it's basically that the clownfish steals um, a layer of mucus from the anemone and covers its body with that mucus so that the, t um, the anemone actually thinks that the clownfish is a part of itself and um, it thinks that the, uh, the clownfish is a part of the anemone so a good, what, what is really good when you are having clownfish especially cluggy clownfish with long technical anemones is that they actually feed it all the time you know if you if you uh, want to feed them shrimp you can just throw down some shrimp in there and they'll actually take it down to the anemone and start feeding it um, and you know that's a more natural way of feeding your anemone is that it's instead of you actually going down with your fingers or with a weird tool and feeding your anemone it's a little bit more it's a little bit less stressful um, and you know that's that's just a good thing you know I actually think that does benefit the anemone in the long run and um, because it do it, it really does stress the anemone if you touch it which is another thing I recommend do not touch your anemones just try to keep them alone is the best thing to do because um, you know when it, I, I have I have touched this anemone a couple of times of course because I need to move it around when it just got when it just got down here so that it didn't sting all of my corals um, but I, I had to um, to sort of you know be very careful I only touched its foot um, you know I can't really avoid um, touching its tentacles sometimes I just try to just try to not do it at least because it's it's that area is the most sensitive part on their body as soon as they get touched you can see they sort of contract um, as a defensive mechanism and you will actually feel this sort of weird um, sort of stinging going on uh, it's actually really strange it, it doesn't sting you um, but it's oh, well I don't know what it is really but when you touch an anemone it's it feels sticky it feels sticky but I don't think it stings you um, because you know they can't penetrate through your thick skin and um, so anemones can sting humans but you can still feel sort of weird weird like I can't really explain it it's a really weird feeling actually um, but um, but
but you know just try to avoid uh, avoid uh, touching your anemone because it will just leave it alone it will find a place and um, where it can sit also a lot of things um, where when when anemone beginners get a sand anemone um, they are getting confused because they'll just float around for a really long time and this is actually a very common thing I mean um, you know anemones sand anemones in specific um, will just float around for a pretty long time they can actually float around for like two months and what happens often is that when they attach itself um, down in the sand it also will move around in the sand because that's just how they live you know that's how they do in nature so they move all the time sand anemones are um, moving all the time in the substrate and you know there are the rose bubble tip anemone for example that attaches to rocks um, and you know like rose bubble tip anemones as soon as you get them down your tank they'll just attach to something almost immediately which is um, which is why I would recommend rose bubble tip anemones for beginners because when I first got an anemone um, which was um, a sea bay anemone which is also a sand anemone I was just I was panicking because it didn't attach to anything and you know my thought was that they gotta attach you know I've read I've read a lot about these anemones I haven't read anything about people saying that they don't attach immediately which is something like there are a lot of things in this hobby that people don't give tips about which um, which I'm gonna try to do with you guys I'm gonna try to give you some of the problems I've had through the years even though I've researched and researched and researched and researched I've still not found anything <laughs> on that topic that I wanted to hear about but anyway you know um, so I was really stressed about it because it didn't it didn't attach I thought it was going to die um, but then it just attached itself a month after and you know it lived for about three or four months which is um, for for that sea bear anemone I got which I can't remember um, it's, it was a mallow sea bear anemone I think it was yeah mallow um, mallow sea bears don't live for very long in captivity they only live for like four or five months so it was a decent um, lifespan it had so yeah um, you know it um, and this anemone does um, require sand you know it does require um, a decent salinity where it's like 1.024 1 1.025 maybe 1.026 I'm not quite sure um, because when I kept uh, the salinity really high um, it actually began to contract to contract a little bit um, so I would recommend um, getting it at a normal level um, also it does require good lighting it does require a little bit of medium water flow not too much though remember that not too much um, and that's pretty much it you know the water temperature should be the same as 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 many other corals around the around the 25 to 26 degrees Celsius some people keep it at 24 degrees Celsius um, which you also can do I've not tried it mine is at 25 degrees Celsius I found that um, a really good range for my corals um, but yeah anyway that's pretty much the only things I can say about this anemone I hope you guys enjoyed this video and see you guys in another video